Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this Monday night in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Well, you know that my favorite resource for information on any tropical system is the National Hurricane Center, nhc.noaa.gov. But the website you've been looking at here is another great one. It's managed by Dr. Levi Cowan, and what it has on this website, again, called tropicaltidbits.com, is some great resources, including this link right here. If you click on it, you can actually get the NOAA missions into each hurricane all the reconnaissance missions and uh, right now mission 17 is currently in the storm and they're collecting data but i want to take you back to the most recent fully completed mission and it's this one here mission number 14. now not only can you see the actual aircraft data crisscrossing the storm but you can even zoom in and see kind of the cross sections of it as well we can watch how the pressure drops in the eye and how the wind speeds respond in the eye wall it's a fantastic resource if you're really into this i highly recommend checking it out we can also look at the satellite imagery and today the mesoscale floater sitting over Hurricane Ian, which is now a Category 2 strength hurricane, was collecting imagery every 30 seconds. So this is a very high time resolution view of this. And what I'm watching for are the deep convective plumes that are happening right now on the south side of this system. No clear eye has opened up yet, and it's gonna be moving over the western side of Cuba, which is gonna be slightly disruptive to this system. But I'll tell you, this is a very healthy hurricane. And one of the indicators, in addition to the deep convective plumes here, is watch the thin cirrus on the northern side of it. That's a, the best view of it, at least. You can see how it is radiating out and turning in a clockwise manner like this. That would be what we call anticyclonic. And that's because on top of very mature, well-developed hurricanes, you have a, a perturbation pressure field that's higher. So high, high pressure that sits on top of it. And what ends up occurring here is that helps exhaust uh, the air that's being lifted in the center out. And that's one by which one way by which the hurricane can continue to strengthen quite quickly. Now, another great thing on Dr. Cowan's site is that he puts together all of the different models and their forecast for intensity. And what we see is that over the next 48 to 72 hours, uh, Hurricane Ian will likely strengthen to become a Cat 3 or Cat 4 hurricanes. Uh, hurricane, excuse me. So we're going to be seeing wind speeds in miles per hour that are possibly over 130 miles an hour. Now, to me, the thing that was most important to watch for today is the spacing of the icons used on the National Hurricane Center's uh, forecast cone map. I was particularly interested in these three right here, because if you watch my morning update, one of the things that we were concerned about with Hurricane Ian was that there's a front to the north. And that front combined with the upper level wind shear, which I'll show you in a few moments, could slow the system down. And in the latest updates, which we now see that Hurricane Ian is expected, see the M's in here, it is expected to maintain category three strength or, category three strength or stronger, that as it approaches Tampa, just to the north of Tampa, the system will slow down. And that is the worst possible scenario. We don't like slow moving hurricanes. They dramatically increase flood threat. That's the major concern here. So this will eventually weaken going through Florida and set up over the southeast where very heavy rainfall, and we'll see those totals in a few moments, could set up across this entire region. But what I want to show you is kind of some reasoning behind this. So this is a look uh, tomorrow at what we expect to see here uh, on the 27th of where the uh, Hurricane Ian should be. Really quickly, I want to apologize from last week. I was calling this would-be system Hermine. The reason for that was we thought it was going to be the next name system, but there was a system way over here off the coast of Africa that got to tropical storm strength first, stole that name out of the list, and that's why we're now at letter I, or Ian. Now, what's been so concerning is this. And the low levels of the atmosphere, there's a deformational flow right here. Some of that coming around this big subtropical high and some around the deeper trough that's going to be responsible for a frost in this area uh, Wednesday morning. Now, because of that, there's a front that sits here. And then that means that Ian has to push up against that front and it's going to slow the forward progress down. There's also kind of... Uh, opposing winds at different levels. And what I mean by that is this is the low level flow tomorrow. This is what the flow looks like in the jet stream. So the jet stream level winds wanna pull in around this ridge on off to the north and east, but it's struggling against the flow near the surface, which is doing this. So the net effect is Ian slows down. And as Ian slows down, it dramatically increases the flooding potential and puts more of uh, Florida's Gulf, risk, uh, Gulf Coast excuse me, at risk. 
Now, my biggest concern along the Gulf Coast is really going to be Tampa. Tampa's got 3 million people in the metro area, and it's very shallow. A lot of it is between 0 and 10 feet above sea level. And the last time we saw a tropical system kind of make this track was back in 1968, and that was Hurricane Gladys. But Gladys still missed Tampa Bay pretty far to the north. This is not probably going to be the case with Ian. And that's because the latest guidance from the European model shows that slowing effect in through here. And it also shows that it's going to just skirt along the coast before moving here into north central Florida. Now, is there still uncertainty with this? Absolutely. It's all going to depend on how it emerges off the coast of Cuba tomorrow. If it's a bit further over here to the west, then certainly we're going to follow more of these westerly tracks. But if it stays right here in the center, I think we will continue to see that the average ensemble guidance is probably the best. And that is certainly what we're getting out of the National Hurricane Center at this point, certainly following the ensemble guidance. The biggest concern is, of course, going to be the flooding potential. And this is just a look at the National Weather Service's map, looking again at how much rainfall we could get out of this over the next five days. Now, take note of the color bar here. Uh, this is one to two inches, two to four, four to six, and then six to ten. So there is going to be a broad area across much of Florida that has the potential at getting between four and ten inches of rainfall with potentially much higher amounts along the coast. Along the coast, we will add in the storm surge part of this as well. And again, uh, the concern around Tampa Bay with 5 to 10 feet of storm surge is that so much of that area is sits between 5 and 10 feet above sea level. And the fact that the bay can help focus some of that water inland means we could be looking at uh, major, major flooding problems here in and around Tampa Bay. It's the same thing all the way up in the Gulf Coast here of, of Florida. So because of all of this, the National Weather Service has issued this afternoon flood watches for a large part of Florida. We have hurricane warnings in place as well. And interestingly enough, just to the west, all of this is red flag warning and fire watch. That's right in through here. And in a few moments, we're going to talk about this frost threat that could extend pretty far uh, to the south of the current area, which is under a frost advisory for tomorrow morning. So I just want to show you something. Before this hurricane gets there, take a look at the latest satellite data over the southeast. Now throughout the day today, let's play this forward again. We can see the streets of clouds setting up on the colder air that's pushing through with that front. Okay, They then hit the ocean and you get rising motion. There's a, there's a breeze, a, a, a coastal breeze effect here. You can also see the thin cirrus running over this part of Florida. So if you're in and watching this right now, look up high that thin cirrus, that is from the northern edge of Ian. But you can already see fires that are breaking out here today. A lot of smoke throughout the lower Mississippi River Valley and pockets in the southeast and over here in the Arklatex region. And that is the area where we have our red flag warnings. Now, what we need to do is take a look at our two models and see how similar they are and what the main features are to be watching. So a couple of things. The jet stream flow is doing this. So there's a deeper trough here bringing in scattered showers over the next 48 hours to the eastern Great Lakes through New England. This, of course, is Ian. We're going to watch a low sneak underneath this going into the Pacific Northwest that's likely going to fizzle out as it tries to make it into the plains late this week. So let's see all these pieces moving together. Going through Tuesday into Wednesday. It looks as though Wednesday evening will be when we'll get pretty close with Ian approaching the shoreline here. It'll be very unclear as to whether the center of circulation will hit north of Tampa or if it'll carry farther to the north here into this part of Florida. But at this point on Wednesday, big dome of high pressure settles in here and that is going to be the source of the clear skies, the high pressure of course, the light winds, and the risk of frost uh, in this particular area. I'll come back to that in a moment. But as Ian moves north and slows down. See that? That was, that was almost a full 24 hours right there. The system is just not making much northward progress. That's when the greatest flood threat exists. Then as we get into Friday, things open up as the high pressure moves off to the northeast and the system gets pulled north. We're going to see rains possibly extending into the Tennessee Valley, the Ohio Valley, along the Appalachian Mountains, throughout the, the southeast and into the mid-Atlantic. Here's that low, by the way, that was moving through the Pacific Northwest. You're going to see that as I go from Saturday into Sunday, and now out into Monday, that that system just never has enough moisture to work with, nor does it have enough upper level support to really just make it across much of the center part of the United States, which means this isn't going to slow down harvest. But you get all the way here to next Monday, and we continue to see what's left of Ian hitting parts of North Carolina and Virginia. 
Now from there, I would like to show you the uh, GFS because the GFS lately has come into better alignment with the European. You're gonna see all the same features. This is where things are Wednesday, 7 a.m. This is the afternoon on Wednesday, the evening on Wednesday. See the same effect, see how it's slowing down so much? The GFS slows it down even more though than the European model does. It has the same feature coming out of the Northwest and the high pressure that was here moves on over to New England. So as we go past Friday into the weekend, the biggest difference is the GFS doesn't spread the rain as far in this direction as the uh, European does. But overall, they have pretty similar forecasts. So let's go get the numbers. This is what we've got from the latest seven day outlook from the European model. And again, a high probability of exceeding 10 inches of rain across a broad section of Florida, a lot of two to five inches in this region. Here's the system that comes through the Northwest and sets up here on the Rockies. But over the next seven days, there's a broad sector of the mid part of the country that sees nothing. It's in the European, it's in the GFS as well. Now the difference between the European and the GFS, I'd love to show you this map, it looks right here, okay? Look how much farther to the west the European, which is wetter in these colors, spreads the rain. But the GFS being slower with Ian produces heavier rain in parts of Florida and just along the coast. So this is a very tricky forecast in this whole area with Ian, as they all are, but you can see the model differences here. Now, in addition to that, we saw a massive typhoon cut across um, uh, the Philippines. We gotta keep an eye on this one because the North Pacific is relatively active right now. And this tropical system seems to be getting pulled into the flow near the Bering Sea. And why that's so important is, is that tropical system, which is here, ends up interacting with the jet stream. Uh, it could reinforce troughing. And I'm gonna show you what I'm concerned about in the longer term now. So as we play this forward, this is a North Pole view. What we've got here is this is by Thursday, the little wave that comes into the Northwest. It's the one that tries to get out into the plains and just doesn't make it. This is Ian. And here's a deeper trough that's sitting here, you know, just between Hawaii and British Columbia. Okay, that's the weekend. Going into early next week, what I'm gonna be watching, let's just stop this out here at day 10. I don't see any bit of a block in the jet stream. The flow comes around like this, runs up over a ridge, dives into a trough that's off the west coast. There seems to be some sense of split flow across the west. Do you see that? There's a southern branch that dips south and a northern branch that bulges north. But that means there's going to be a lot of convergence in the midsection of the country. And because of that convergence, we expect to see drier conditions overall. Some of the precip you see here, it's from that slow moving system late this week. But there'll be a big section of the country right in through here that just doesn't measure much. Over the next 15 days, this is your uh, uh, precipitation anomaly graphic. Now from there, let's uh, flip this over to a quick discussion about temperature, then we'll do the long range and wrap this up. We've now talked about the frost advisories that are out and posted here. Leading up to this point, at least up to yesterday, I made a map that shows, and I showed this in the morning report, where we've already had a frost so far uh, between uh, the 18th and the 25th. The latest data suggests that uh, over the next seven days, this whole region could touch 32 degrees Fahrenheit. All right. If we go look at those temperatures, we'll start off with the highs and then I'll show you the lows. So here's Monday's high temperatures. You've already experienced these. Tuesday, very hot in the Northwest while much colder in and around the Great Lakes with that trough. By Wednesday, we see the effect of the cloud cover in the Southeast, the cooler air that's still within that trough that's digging through the Eastern part of the United States. But by Thursday, getting into Friday, there is some moderation in the midsection of the country. And going toward the weekend, we start to see temperatures rebounding. But before that, let's show you these overnight lows. Here is Tuesday morning. That's where our first frost risk is gonna be right up here in parts of Minnesota. From there into Wednesday morning, broader area in through here, maybe clipping parts of Northern Iowa, which this would still be an early frost in this part of Iowa if it happens. We'll keep a close eye on that. There could also be some patchy frost in Northern Illinois. But after this, the cooler weather stays over Northern Wisconsin, UP Michigan, and this part of Lower Michigan before moving into New England. And after that, the lows rebound. Now beyond this point, because the jet stream is going into that pattern that kind of splits in the west, take a look at the temperature pattern for that first full week of October. Now going toward that second week of October. You overall see a lack of a connection to deep cold air in the forecast. 
So we just need to pay attention closely to see, you know, who, who gets this frost and who doesn't over the next few days. Now from here, let's talk long range. La Nina, it continues to strengthen. You can see the cold water in through here and the Hofmuller diagram. We're right back at it again. I mean, look at this. These are very strong trade winds here over the next 15 days, and we've got back our westerly wind bursts coming out of the Indian Ocean. That means right here, look on top where they meet between phases five and six is where the MJO is gonna live. And the latest European model finally lets the MJO pop out of null, come into phase five and possibly sweep through phase six. Now why we care about this is because historically that tends to lead to an unblocked pattern in the jet stream. So a big trough that sweeps out of Asia into the North Pacific, another one that comes into the Pacific Northwest. So this tends to allow the jet stream to really pick up momentum across the Pacific. When does it happen? It may not be until we get past, uh, you know, the, the, the 8th, 9th, 10th of October, but that just shows you that the atmosphere is ready to push systems through the Pacific. Now, because of this, the new long range European model that came out looking at the time period of like the 11th of October to the 11th of November continued what it trended toward last week, was, which was to keep the Pacific Northwest wet early for that second half of October to the beginning of November. And even though this shows up drier across a broad section of the country, if the Pacific jet stream picks up momentum, we will get systems that roll through the country. So when a harvest window opens up, take advantage of it if you're if you're able to take advantage of it now because i think this pattern is going to be shifting a bit as we go forward from there i would like to show you what's going on in south america because you can continue to see see the convection popping here the monsoon is going we also have a front that's parked right here across southern brazil now when we look at the moisture the monsoon has yet to make it over into Brazil's eastern growing areas like Chocantins and Goiás and Minas Gerais and even parts over here like Sao Paulo getting over to parts of Mato Grosso do Sul. We can see it's been a bit wetter in southern Brazil. Near normal soil moisture here in Mato Grosso, but very dry in pockets of Argentina. And that's something to be very concerned about because over the next 10 days, we see here that southern Brazil, Uruguay, this is southern Paraguay. This is the Parna River and Argentina are forecast to be dry. Along that stalled out front, things are looking wetter. Near normal in eastern uh, Mato Grosso, but still a drier go of it for a little while here. But many farmers are going to see this forecast and press on because from October 8th to November the 8th, there's still good indications of above normal rains, which means we could see a fast plant uh, with the uh, first crop of soybeans going in. The newest updates, though, suggest that the drier risks in southern Brazil, parts of Paraguay, Uruguay, and Argentina continue to be there. And this is where I think our early season problems are going to be. So a lot to be watching here in South America as they start a season, and of course a major hurricane to be keeping an eye on here in North America. So try to cover it all today. Um, we'll keep you updated in my morning report tomorrow. And until then, have a good rest of your day. Thanks.